characterize your experience as a black sports journalist in Canada? You that question any more broad. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you, had, if you had one word to describe it, what would it be? Careful. I know. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I don't know that I could describe it in one word. It's been fun because the job is fun, and that has nothing to do with race. It's also been fraught, if you could use another word, because um, from the standpoint of like uh, career trajectories and just the, the office stuff that we all have to put up with, and the standpoint of uh, perceptions and reputations, like all the same stuff that black athletes were up against in terms of being perceived as ungrateful, um, arrogant, uh, standoffish, etc. cetera, uh, you're up against those in the office too, and you're up against, and those affect your career. So if you're not the guy, and like as the black person, how many black people work in print sports journalism in Canada at, at big shops? Like not very many, probably fewer than this many across the whole country. In our business, you know, they want you to be confident. They want you to be exuberant. They want you to be self-assured. But when you're black and you're too much of those things, well, then you're arrogant. You're full of yourself. I've had these discussions with people. I've butted these heads with people, butted heads with people on these issues. But um, the guy with no melanin, you're not telling him to be humble. So don't tell me to be humble. I'm going to be who I am. To Morgan's point, it's, it's a difficult um, way. You, ha you have to navigate your way through this business. So I feel really fortunate to sit here with these guys and be able to sort of share our moments. Uh, and one thing I'll say on a positive note is there's been a pretty good evolution to what's happened. My first TV job was in Sault Ste. Marie in 1996. Wow. So 22 years ago. Oh God, I shouldn't be saying that, but <laughs> it was a while ago. And uh, to see how now when I watch television, uh, it reflects more you know, faces, more diversity than it did certainly 22 years ago. So it's a long way to go, but it's getting there. Um, it's not just, wow, that's the one guy. There's, there's people there. There's, there's, we're, we're moving in the right direction. It's been a slow evolution maybe to get to where it's getting, but it's nice to see that there's been some progression that's taken place. At first, it, it's, it's stressful. Um, you know, you, I'm usually the only black woman in the sports department, and sometimes you're wondering if you're missing out or if you're not getting it, whatever it is. Being an athlete and we're all into sports, you, you, you start to realize, oh right, that didn't kill me. Oh, okay, I fell down here, I got back up. And so now, all these years later, like you, 22 years later, <laughs> <laughs> you know, almost 20 years in the business, um, it's liberating now. Now, um, I, I don't have those, I don't hold myself back wondering if it's because I look a certain way or my hair is a certain way that that may keep me from getting to where I need to go. Now I go there and I make myself known and I, and I, and I lay out what I have to offer and, if it, and if, it, if it takes, it takes. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I walk away and I move on because I don't have time to sort of second guess myself. I can't do that anymore. I did have that. I had a lot of second guessing. Oh, is my hair still, is it good? We stopped talking about hair. We're gonna have to change the subject. More hair talk, right? Sorry, sorry guys. Um, but um, it, through trials and tribulations, like every athlete who goes at it every single day, falls down, gets back up, you realize it's not gonna kill me. You realize life is not on an even playing field. You realize that you gotta make what you have yours and then you move forward and because I am a black woman and I know that I'm there aren't that many of people who look like me in the world of sport reporting that it, in a way at first it was it was um, it felt like a hindrance and now I see it and I've turned it around and I've used it to my advantage it's also a little bit different for me, growing up in Atlanta, Georgia, and, and eventually making my way to Canada, starting in Montreal and now working in Toronto, there are just things that I had to get used to, not even being a black journalist, just being a journalist covering hockey for the first time really professionally uh, in my life and, and kind of going in with that mindset that not only I, may I be the only one here in terms of a person of color in that room, but that I also have to be the best journalist here if I want to stick around. I knew that those hurdles and those pitfalls were going to come, and I certainly I had them in Montreal. They continue here in Toronto, but it's about perseverance and, and moving on. And certainly, kind of Rosie, to your point, I'm not going to let anything stop me at this point. Uh, I'm here, I've got my foot in the door, and I intend to keep it there. And, and watching 
uh, colleagues like, like the three sitting to my right. It's something that it continues to inspire me as well. I had a Caucasian uh, co-worker. You still say that? Well, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> I had a white co-worker. I had a white <laughs> co-worker um, who, 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 you know, in the past brought me to the side and said, do you think you don't get opportunities because of your race? And I, I didn't really know how to answer, but the first thing that came out of my mouth was, well, that happens in every industry. Like, we, we know that. So for me to think that that doesn't happen in this industry, in an industry that's historically been run by older white people, I, I, I would be stupid to think it doesn't. But it's one of those things where it'll haunt you if you continue to think about it constantly because unless you have any tangible proof, what are you going to do about it? Is, is that something that you guys have had to do mental gymnastics about? Thinking about, well, did I not get this opportunity because I wasn't good enough or because of my pigment? I mean, personally, I'll say it's a very subjective industry right off the hop. Um, I know, you know, when I've had auditions for different um, opportunities in my career, uh, sometimes it works in your benefit. Sometimes they're looking for, you know, a minority male, a black male, whatever the case may be. Um, and then the flavor of the month may change as it has. We've seen sort of an evolution in that regard uh, as well. I definitely think employers sometimes are going to categorize you in a certain, okay, we've checked that box off, or we checked that box off. So you just got to be aware of your surroundings in that sense. It's not always going to uh, limit you, but I think you're not going to generally turn on a newscast and see five people of, of color. It's just not going to happen, Except right? Except tonight. Except <laughs> <laughs> <It's not> tonight, <laughs> literally. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do not adjust your set. Yeah. <laughs> uh, subjective. The adjective I would word, I would use is uh, incestuous. Right? This is mm. this is and in and, and in this sense, journalism journalism isn't different from any other industry. Although we like to point at other industries industries and say, hey, this guy's only hiring his buddies. Um, isn't this corrupt? What about merit? But journalism works the same way. And so when we talk about race, race sometimes is indirectly related to that in, in terms of the networks people have. Because people that get ahead are the people that are connected to the people who are in a position to put them ahead and, and, and have mentors who want them to succeed. Because you'll go as far in this business as the person with, who opens the doors wants you to go. And if you don't have talent but someone wants you to succeed, you'll find a measure of success. I came in cold. I didn't know anybody. I have no, my parents immigrated from Nigeria, came here, and you just start cold. So I decided that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay the groundwork for the people behind me. I'm going to lay the groundwork for uh, the girls and the guys who come behind me who look like me. But, but it's um, true. Yeah, but, but what it's Rosie's true. saying is you true know? because we look at the people who sort of paved the way for our opportunities and there's, there's a handful of them that really had to make inroads in the industry right. and had they uh, not been professional, had they not worked hard, had they, they not endure, been right? the pros pros, right. then it would have been a longer period for the acceptability and the acceptance of, right. of bringing mm -hmm people who look a little different yeah. on TV or into this uh, you know, sports broadcasting world would have taken longer. It was something definitely that I had to adjust to in my first couple of years in the business, trying to navigate that and, and figure out, all right, how am I gonna still be myself while not pleasing other people, but at least being pleasing to other people? And Donovan, I mean, I, I think, you know, I don't get too caught up in, in our personal situation as journalists on a day-to-day -day level. I, I'm more interested in how the athletes are treated. And, you know, there's a number of different examples. Obviously, the Colin Kaepernick situation has been, the, you know, one of the big highlights, political sports highlights of the last year. But I look back to five, six years ago and a guy like P.K. Subban, who, at least on paper in my eyes, does basically everything right. You know, there's a philanthropic guy, a guy who embraces the community, has a lot of personality, a lot of flair, which is something that could be go a long way uh, in the sports world, embraces his role as, as um, you know, a leader and someone, a role model. Um, but there was a lot of naysayers and a lot of people who were very, you know, detracting from what he was doing and at the same time you have a guy like Brent Burns who's a fabulous guy and a flamboyant and fun guy and he was always embraced oh he's so fun loving he loves the game he's a great guy and I'm thinking what's the difference here PK's flamboyant and fun too but he's viewed by some one whale he's a troublemaker he's in it for himself Brent Burns is a, a great team guy and that's not to detract from Brent Burns at all I'm just making the point I think that that it's more important to me it's like wow how do we view the athletes that we're covering because they deserve to be viewed on, on equal playing field and that doesn't happen that often. 
we see this industry through a different lens and I wonder how much you guys notice the coded language, right? Antonio, Antonio Brown is athletic, Julian Edelman is savvy and smart, PK is flamboyant and, and selfish, and you know, that's not said in the same way um, about, about other players. It, how important is it for you guys to be able to drive the story so that some of that language isn't necessarily used? It's hugely important when they talk about the Williams sisters. They're aggressive and they're, they even said they're beasts. They attack. These are these words. And then when they talk about, um, I don't know, maybe Maria Sharapova or uh, other athletes, they're, they think, they're thinkers, they're calculating. Um, how do you win, what is it, over 20, 23 Grand Slam titles without thinking and without cal being a calculative athlete and being smart? How do you do that? But those words, those adjectives are not uh, placed on someone like Serena Williams. And that bothers me a lot. And if you don't, then you are subversively changing that kind of the way that people who are maybe new to the game and watch the game. Oh, right. The black athlete is just simply uh, aggressive and athletic. And that's not true. That's not true. You're not you're not fully reporting the story. And it bothers me because a reporter should be well rounded and should have that kind of uh, language and uh, articulation and, and be able to articulate the, the what, how the game is unfolding and not change it because of the person, the color of the person's skin. So that bothers me. What Rosie gave you right there is also the perspective of someone who is competed, not just competed, prepared to compete Thank you. at a high level. Mm -hmm. Because the only, the only forum in the world where we talk about talent as if talent is a curse is when we talk about black people in sport. If you are a talented uh, violinist, people celebrate your talent. But if you're a black athlete, they talk about your talent. Because first of all, we treat talent and hard work as if they're mutually exclusive. So when the black person succeeds, we say, well, of course they succeeded. They're talented, as if they didn't have to work hard to develop this talent. Newsflash, in the NFL, all those guys are very good at football. They are all talented. They are all very hardworking. It's, some of them have more of one than the other, but like compared to us, compared to the rest of it, and I was good at football and so were you, but they're still more talented <laughs> and more and, and harder working at football than I was or, 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 or you were. But it's only when it comes to black athletic success when we talk about talent, as if talent is a drawback, as if talent's not something you should be proud of. It's only with black athletes where we talk about talent as if talent is something bad and not something beautiful. I think it's an easy trap to fall into when you're a journalist, specifically a, a journalist that's not of color, to sit there and use those keywords, dual threat quarterback, <laughs> gym rat. They use these monikers and they, they use these nicknames and they use these symbols and we all know what they mean. They're buzzwords at this point, but that doesn't mean that they're okay. I think it's incumbent on us to sort of break down, you know, what's this guy all about? Oh, it's just a natural ability. No, you know, he's worked at it. And I think it's, it's little by little and I think when you have more diversity in the media, you're gonna then get different perspectives and it'll start to erode what the problems have been, but it's taken a long time. It's not just diversity, it's the skill set. Because the other thing about all these racist dog whistle, dog whistle cliches is that they're cliches, and the cliche is the crutch of a lazy journalist, and that's lazy. part of it. You it's haven't, lazy. you haven't, you, you haven't, you haven't activated your neurons to find a way to, to describe a black athlete accurately, so you just rely on what you've heard your whole life. No matter what the journalist looks like, that journalist still has to have the skill set and the, and, and the ability and the willingness uh, to evaluate these athletes as human beings and not just the jumble of stereotypes and cliches. Well, we see it at the Combine, right? Any athletic quarterback, he's the next Mike Vick, he's the next Donovan McNabb, he's not the next John Elway no, you can, or Steve Young. And you can also tell the color, the skin color of a prospect just by reading the scouting report. Let's talk about covering the actual athlete. Uh, and when you are in field and, and covering uh, black athletes who don't see people of color that often, and that can, can be an issue with familiarity, is that relationship between you and that athlete any different um, th than if you weren't uh, a minority? I, I've, I've had athletes come up and say, hey, it's good to see, you know, there's a little mix here and it's <laughs> nice to see you doing well. And I think sometimes they feel there'll be maybe a level of fairness projected from us uh, that they might not feel they're always going to get from other journalists depending on their situation. So I've certainly throughout my career had some athletes from different sports, basketball, uh, hockey, especially hockey. I think uh, they like to see that there's diversity happening um, because they're also very much in a minority with what they're doing. So I've had that in the past. 
I've seen that twinkle in the eye, and I've got like the double diversity going on, black woman, they're like, whoa, hey, oh, okay. <laughs> there is and continues to be one particular coach of a particular team that I will cover sometimes and, you know, give me a little, a little nod, a little wink or something, and I think it is one of those older guys seeing a person, a young person of color Absolutely. in the business. Yeah. And it, it, we, it's never been said, it doesn't go out there, but I think I'm thinking what he's thinking, and it's nice to see.